Guru Nation, welcome back to another episode of Random Musings from the Clinical Trials Guru. I'm excited because I've never interviewed a medical writer, and we have Christina Sanguinetti on. She's the president and medical writer at Laconic Medical Writing, Inc. She's up in Ontario, Canada. How are things going in Canada right now, Christina? It's cold. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, over here, I'm in Arizona, and it's like going to be 70 sunny we consider it cold here but yeah that's nothing like what you guys are experiencing we were put in touch by a mutual acquaintance gabriella um and she's uh, gabriella cross she's somebody i know from the cro sponsor world and i put out a um, like a little post on linkedin hey anybody know any medical writers i've never interviewed one and people keep asking me how they could become a medical writer and what they do. And I posted it and I'm glad I got introduced to Christina. Christina's on it. Gabriella introduced us. Christina was on it really quickly. That's, I don't know much about you, Christina, but that alone like separates you from so many others who (laughs) take forever to get back to you. I mean, you were like right away, very professional and just setting up the zoom. Very, very easy. Thanks to Casey and, and you for doing that. So Welcome. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. So what, let's start with the basics. I mean, can we talk a little bit about your experience? How does one become, or your education? Let's start with your education. How does one become a medical writer? Like, is there a prerequisite you have to have, or is it loose kind of like clinical research? Is it just very vague as to who can be a PI or a coordinator? So medical writing um, is a very interesting little niche, right? We're kind of like technical writers, but very specific for medicine and science. Um, When I started in clinical research was about 20 years ago. um, And it was very different back then because medical writers were not what they are today. Like today we're a lot more recognized. Um, We're fairly new to the clinical research scene um, as a group with the title. Um, And there's been a lot of changes over the years in terms of education and how you actually get into it, right? Um, So if you talk to a lot of people that started around when I started, um, we were all kind of thrown in by accident, right? So you see- That sounds like clinical research. Right. Um, And a lot of us didn't even know that there was a term for what we were doing, right? We just thought we were writing. Um, It's evolved since then. There are certifications you can get. A lot of universities, especially in the United States, actually have formal master's programs now for medical writing. Um, you know, there are a few in Canada, right? But we're a little bit behind you guys in terms of that education. Um, there are associations now you can join and get certifications through that. So in a very short time, you know, the industry has definitely evolved. Yeah, that's interesting because the question I got that led to me there was a lot of questions about this over the years that I've kind of gathered, but the one that like put me over the edge and said, Hey, I have to interview someone is the educational requirement because I always assumed, Hey, you have to have a PhD or you should be an MD or a pharmacist or some kind of clinical background to do this. But it sounds like from what you said, it's very similar to, to clinical research in the sense that there's no real regulations around this. It's just what the industry wants. So I think people get confused about what medical writing entails as a whole. There are different types of medical writers. And along with the type of re- medical writing that you do, of course, your qualifications are going to follow, right? Uh, so you have medical writers that are very specific to the regulatory domain, right? So protocols, CSRs, um, And a lot of the times they do ask for PhDs in there, but it's not a prerequisite, right? You have medical writers that stay towards more patient education, right? So you're using more layman terms, right? Um, You tend to see a different type of requirement for that because obviously you have different skills. Um, So there really are, medical writing is a group, but there are within that group different types of medical writing. So what I would suggest to everybody is kind of, look at what type of medical writing you're interested in, right? And then you can see what kind of qualifications you need for that specific type. That's, that's interesting. So let's break that down because I've never, you know, I've been in research for 20 years now 
I never really thought to break it down that way. I just assume medical writer, these are the people that write the protocols. But you said there's different areas. So let's break down like the most common, right? The from what you mentioned, let's go like more more in detail, maybe if you can. Sure. So you have the regulatory writers. Um, and sometimes in larger pharma companies, um, you're not called a medical writer, you could be called a regulatory writer, like there are different titles for the same thing, right? Um, but again, you specify, um, you're specifically writing investigator brochures, study mm -hmm. protocols, uh, the clinical study reports, and other clinical trial documents might get involved, right? Like sometimes you're doing CRF, sometimes you're doing ICFs. Um, it really depends on, you know, what kind of company you're working for. If it's a large pharma company, if it's a CRO, right? Um, with CROs, you tend to have, you know, a more diverse workload. Um, but anything basically regulatory has to do with a regulatory submission, right? I gotcha. That's regular. Um, so regulatory, anything right. with a regulatory submission. So such as protocol, investigator, brochure, clinical study report. Exactly. Okay. What about when they're, I guess, investigator initiated trials, maybe not going to the FDA, but going to publish on like nature or science. Is that also in the realm of medical writer? So here's when you start to get into a little crossover, okay? okay? So with my specific business, we do cross over a lot. Some medical writers do not cross over at all, okay? Gotcha. Um, there's a type of medical writing that I like to refer to as publications, right? And that includes manuscripts for scientific journals, right? So you do have medical writers and that's all they do, right? Is just these manuscripts, right? And there have been studies that have shown that you know, investigators that work with medical writers have a higher rate of acceptance into these journals. So these medical writers, you know, they pay attention obviously to the content, but also the specific formatting of each journal, um, things like word count, editing, uh, references, all of that kind of nitpicky stuff that obviously investigators don't like to do. <laughs> right. Right. Um, so that's what we kind of call publications. And along with that are the abstracts. Posters okay. would also fall into that category um, for conferences um, and things like that. Because um, often out of these conferences and congresses will come scientific papers, right? Right. Um, so there's a group of medical writers that handle that. So, so far, both of these groups, and this is great, actually. I, <laughs> this is one of the reasons I do the podcast is to learn for myself. Like, I didn't realize, thanks to the community for the questions, because it would have probably taken me another couple of years to interview a medical writer. But so from what I understand from regulatory or from publications, manuscripts, abstracts, those two categories, uh, they all require some kind of like science knowledge, right? And maybe even further, like a domain specific therapeutic indication knowledge. Can this be self-taught? Like, can you just be really good? Let's say you've been a coordinator in oncology studies for let's say solid tumors for 20 years could you theoretically become a medical writer a hundred percent right um i believe that if there's a will there's a way and if you want it to be a career not just a job you'll find a way to do it and you'll be excellent doing it right um, i myself have a bachelor of medical science in immunology and microbiology so i have a very very uh, heavy science background but early in my career, I actually was a clinical research coordinator. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes. This is an even better um, interview now. Awesome. So that would that makes me a little different in the field because when I'm writing a protocol, I always have the end user in mind, which is the coordinator, because I can tell you there were many times as a coordinator, I got these protocols and I'm like, how am I supposed to pull this off? Right. Wow. Like you're in a busy clinic, you have more than one study running, you have one ECG room. And all the studies are on the ECG at the same time, right? Like certain things are not feasible. So my CRC experience actually helps me when I'm writing these protocols, right? Um, because, you know, amendments are expensive. I read an article the other day that's saying for each phase three protocol amendment costs half a million dollars. By the time you've reconsented, gotten ethics approval, gotten all the approvals you need. So wait, each you know, phase three amendment. Protocol amendment. Yes. Phase three. For amendment. Yes is half a million dollars. Exactly. 
Wow. Would a phase two be less, right? Because it's less sites, less patients. I'm well, that's a situation where you have to reconsent the patients, right? Yeah. Um, you need the ethics approval, the regulations. So that's kind of more of like a worst case scenario. Wow. But anyone in clinical research, like we all know how many amendments, right? Usually um, three, phase three. three per on average, three to four. Right. Right. So you can see the cost that's involved in this. So if you can prevent some of these amendments at the beginning, right, as a wow. protocol writer um, <laughs> and make sure that it's feasible for the clinic, um, of course, you're saving the sponsor money. But who's the end user of that? Well, right. the average person who's buying those drugs, right, because the costs trickle down. You know what? Right. You can always Casey, who's on, you know, she's been a coordinator for 10 years. So she just joined us on the audit recently and it was a Chinese sponsor so the the they're a little I guess I mean I know they're catching up with the research but they're still behind our standards as far as so they're using our expertise as auditors to help them adjust their future protocols because we saw a lot of vagueness in the protocol mm -hmm. and that vagueness directly caused potential deviations at least like GCP questions and so these are things like Christina, you're saying if you have a good protocol writer or a good medical writer, you can avoid that, right? Right, or you can mitigate the effects, right? Um, and from the medical writing point of view, um, you know, the CSR is going to come at the end, right? And the more deviations you have um, and the more amendments, ultimately is the more work you're going to have to put into that CSR, right? Casey, I see you unmuted yourself. She wants to say something. Oh, yes, I do. When she said writing a protocol for the CRC or having the clinical research coordinator in mind, oh, my goodness. <laughs> I, I'm, I, I'm, I just instantly fell in love with you. <laughs> <laughs> I think I found my new career. Honestly, I think so. wow. This, wow. Is why, this is why, like, Guru Nation, thank you for the questions because it's not something yes. I would have ever connected that it, they're related, like this industry is even more interrelated than I thought, because I always thought medical writer was this ivory tower, people just, you know, from above that somehow create the protocol. I didn't realize people like Christina, former coordinators. I mean, this is awesome. But that makes you unique though, right? How many people in your position have been coordinators at one point? Is that rare? I am unique in that, okay, okay. right? So I, I do have a more full view of, um, you know, all aspects of clinical research. And I'm sure there are others like me that exist out there. Um, but to get back to your original question about qualifications, um, you know, having those letters after your name, whether it's MD, PhD, just about whatever, it gets you through the front door. But I think what really makes you excel is what you bring to the table in terms of your experience and you're willing to learn. How did, so I got to ask them, okay, you've been, let's talk a little bit about your career. You were a coordinator. Can you kind of walk us through how many years, uh, what kind of institution it was, and then work your way to how you became a medical writer from that, if unless you did something in between as well? Um, so, again, I got thrown into it not knowing what I was doing, right? So I graduated from school. I had nothing holding me back. So what do you do? You take off and you go to Europe. <laughs> right? All right. <laughs> um, so I'm in Europe. And I end up at one of the medical universities and I end up teaching English, ironically, right? Um, and um, I found out that everything in Europe has to be submitted in English. So if you're a native speaker, right, you're in demand. So I started doing grant proposals and study designs. And remember, at this point, I had no idea what I was doing. It was a job I had to, you know, I'm living, I'm, I'm teaching English, I'm doing these grants. Um, and then certain circumstances happened and I came back to Canada. So I was in Europe about two years doing this. Uh, when I came back, I started, you know, I, I really liked what I was doing and I started doing a little research into it. I'm like, oh, there's a term, right? We're medical writers. We have an association, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but because like you said, I didn't have a PhD, I was actually told you'll never be a medical writer, right? I see. Um, <laughs> And I'm the personality. If you tell me no, I'm going to say, okay, watch and I'll show you. I was just going to ask you a lot of people, majority of people would give up there. Right. Um, so what I did in the meantime to get experience, right? Because remember, I didn't have that PhD to get me through the door, right? Right. So I found some jobs as a coordinator. 
right? Oh, so you so intentionally I, did that. Right. Um, because experience can come from everywhere, right? right? CRAs are a wealth of knowledge. Coordinators, I think they don't get enough credit for what they have to do, to be honest, right? Um, the stress of all those SAE reports and all of that, like um, they, they really need more recognition. Um, and I did the coordinator thing. I worked for CRO and I also did it at Sick Kids Hospital in Canada, right? So I did pediatrics as well. Um, and I didn't like it because of that responsibility. Like I didn't like knowing that, you know, I could have a patient's life in my hand. I didn't like knowing I had 24 hours for an SAE that I had to report. Like carrying all of that stress, and I had a little kid at that time as well, was just so overbearing, right? And I said, I have to find a way to go to the other end, right? And it's not to say medical credit isn't stressful. It is. It's just a different type of stress, right? Right. Um, and I joined the associations, right? I started taking courses through the associations, and I started to build... Um, my professional representative, say, right? Which, which associations uh, was it? So there's AMWA, which is the American Metal Writers Association, right? Okay. Um, and that's very, very strong in North America. You do have the European Metal Writers Association for those in Europe, and they kind of work together, right? Um, and you also have ISMAP, which is an International Society for Medical Publication Professionals, and they're more international. The three of them, very interestingly, though, they work together, right? And you'll often see them publish joint statements about things together. They created a code of ethics that we abide by um, and different things like that. So I think, you know, if you can only choose one, any one of them, I think would be wonderful. You meet a lot of great people. They all wow. offer, you know, further education. Um, and that's an option. If you can't afford to get, a, you know, go and do a PhD or a master's program, they're actually very, very affordable to take some of these, you know, workshops just through the associations. Wow. This is, yeah, this is mind blowing because I told you I have a, like a small CRO. We do some investigator initiated trials and because of YouTube, people have been reaching out and saying, hey, can you help me write a synopsis? I only wrote one synopsis, and that was with Chris. And that was really tough. But uh, all the technical stuff I had to Google, like about that particular condition, I had to Google because we had to come up with assessments for the study. So I looked up, like, what's the gold standard for this and that? I mean, that's kind of how I put the synopsis together. But I mean, to write an actual protocol, you know, I don't think I could have just jumped in and done that. Um, what is your take on this? Like just piece by piece, the way I'm doing it, not saying I'm going to be a medical writer, but <laughs> should somebody want to do something like that? Do they, where do they even start besides the association? Like at some point you're going to get a project and what they're asking for, you may not fully be qualified for. So is it one of those things where you just kind of have to learn as you go and let them know, hey, I'm going to be honest with you. It's my first time, but I'm going to do what I can. Or How do you do that? And I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. Even if you are fully qualified, you're going to be terrified of that first protocol. Right? All right. So it wasn't just me then. Huh? <laughs> okay. I trained many writers and I see the same thing right? It doesn't matter from which aspect of clinical research you come from or what your background is. That first protocol is so intimidating for the very reason you said, you don't know where to start. Well, right? I felt like the client knew I've never done that, but it, it was a client that we had trust with, but I actually felt, and, and he wanted us to see if med like actual medical writers can do it. And they were out of his budget. So he's like, well, you can do it. I said, look, man, I'll do what I can, but I actually felt bad Googling things because I was like, just by doing that, I feel like I'm not capable of figuring it out, you know, but I, I what else could I do but Google? You know, even the most experienced mental writers, there are times that we are going to Google something because the industry is changing so fast, right? Especially over the past couple of years, um, you know, the mechanism of action of drugs have changed drastically, right? Devices, like some of the things we're coming out with, with AI and this technology is just mind blowing, right? Mm -hmm. These things have never been done before, right? So we don't have a pathway to follow. Right. Even some of the regulatory bodies are kind of stuck of like, you know, what do we do with this new technology? Um, so as experienced as you are, you'll never know everything there is to know. And you know what? That's OK. 
makes me feel better. Not that, not that I like that. I didn't really enjoy. I don't think that's for me, but it's good to know you now because when we get these random projects, I know who to contact. Um, wow. Speaking of AI, because you brought it up, everybody's worried AI is going to take their jobs in clinical research outside of it or ancillary to it in medical writing. Do you, what do you think about this? Cause I I've heard some vendors brag about, you know, they're AI tech vendors and they brag about, well, we can design the best protocols with our AI because we go through study results and the AI is able to kind of put together a protocol. What do you think about this? So ironically, you mentioned that. Um, it's something I wanted to do when I first started medical writing is that I thought, you know, a lot of it could be automated, right? So wow. I'm currently working with a company that's creating a software that will come out this year to automate some of this. But throughout the process, I also realized how much of it cannot be automated and the value of a really good metal writer will always be there. Um, and the reason for that is, yes, you can template protocols, you can template um, CSRs, and in some respects, they are templated already, right? There's ICH requirements and different things we have to you know, pay attention to when we write. But interpretation is what is important, right? And I'll give you a good example. When the pandemic happened, a lot of clinics couldn't see patients face-to-face, -face, right? Right. So what happened? Well, the patients had to self-report, you know, whatever it was they needed to report for the study, whether it be weights or whatever, right? Well, we all know that there's a bias that's introduced the moment you start with self-reporting, right? <laughs> okay. Yes. But this is what this is the data we have to work with. Right. So a really good writer, and I've seen this happen over and over again, you know, have to sit back and say, well, the impact of this self-reporting, because there's a pandemic that we've never dealt with before. Right. Yes. How do, how does that affect the interpretation of the results? Right. What are the other factors that are involved? Right. And things like that are written into protocols and they're definitely written into the CSRs at the end. Right. Can AI technology do that when you know, that whole concept of a pandemic was never there before. Hmm. So I think there's always going to be situations where a really, really good medical writer, um, you know, they'll always be needed. Yeah, I agree. I think the same uh, principle applies to any profession, really. I think the cream rises to the top. I think the smart ones, you know, and you're a young and I mean, you're going to have to be in this industry for at least another 50 years. So, and, and me too. So we got to figure out how to work with these things and make sure that we always remain relevant. Our services remain relevant. Um, yeah, because I think CRAs kind of fight with these same internal uh, battles. Uh, will I be needed? Will I be replaced? I don't think so. Coordinators, I don't think so. I think patients trust humans. I think with medical writing, it's just a different element of being human that is still valuable. Um, and AI can help in certain parts, but then the humans need to be involved in the different aspects of it. Oh, this is awesome. This is awesome, Christina. So what's next for you? Like, what, what, thank you so much for uh, inspiring others. I know the person who asked the question is going to be so happy to watch this because from what I understand, they only have a bachelor's degree. So, and then what your background as a coordinator helps me with my narrative because I tell everybody, CRC, if you want to be anything in clinical research, but also in life sciences in general, clinical research coordinators, like Grand Central Terminal, from there, you can go so many different places. And I think you help reinforce that narrative <laughs> that I have. Uh, you help confirm it. But what's next? You know, like I said, you are young. Are you thinking about what's next? You kind of hinted with AI and figuring out how to utilize it better. What do you have in mind for, for, for the future of your career and of the industry? I love metal writing. Um, and in terms of clinical research, I can't see myself doing anything else but metal writing, right? Um, but the industry of like the metal writing industry hasn't changed that much in terms of technology. Right. Um, and medical writers, we do need that technology, right? There's ECTD formatting that if you have to do it manually, it takes forever, right? What's that? What's um, this EC? What did you say? So, those are like all the hyperlinks that go into um, a CSR. 
that okay. you need to do before the submission to, you know, whether it's the FDA, Health Canada, European uh, Medical Association. ECTD. So. Yeah. Um, and I think what the medical credit industry needs as a whole right now is some innovation, right? To make our job easier because c- protocols are becoming more complicated, right? Um, which makes every document related to it more complicated. Right. And we're spending a lot of time doing things that we don't necessarily need to do. Right. Um, So what I'm hoping to do with my partners and the software and innovations that we're involved in is to take away some of that monotony. Right. Um, So that medical writers are being valued um, and that, you know, they're really spending their time where their time needs to be spent. Right. Because like you said, um, one of the barriers to hiring a medical writer sometimes is cost. Right. So you know, if we can give you the best value for that cost, you know, I think more people would be able to get involved with medical writers. And I think it would be better for the industry as a whole. More studies, faster studies. Exactly. You mentioned, I never take notes when I interview. So this says a lot about (laughs) the content you're putting out, you're giving me right now. Protocols becoming more complicated. Again, it's another narrative I keep echoing on this podcast because I see it with my own eyes. I've been doing this full time since 2005 and I, every year. And, and now I'm back to being a coordinator because we started a, a brand new clinic and I'm seeing like the protocols are extremely complex now. Fairly. Like I can't even, I, I hate the people that designed this trail that I'm working on. It's terrible, but I know why they did it. They're trying to cherry pick certain data and we can get into that too. But let's talk more about the macro of what you just said. Protocols are becoming more complicated. Why do you think that is? Like, just what's your personal opinion on why that's happening? I think there's many factors. One, I think the technology, right, whether it's it's drug or device, um, is becoming more complicated, right? Obviously, you know, we know more about science today than we did 20 years ago, right? Um, I think funding is important too, right? Sometimes funding is limited and people want to get the most they can uh, you know, out of, out of their resources. So you start, every drop out of that orange. Right. So you'll see protocols now that have like 20 secondary endpoints <laughs> say, well, before you didn't, they didn't cram all of that into the study or you didn't have as many sub studies from it. Right. I see. Um, which we used to see. I mean, I remember when I was a coordinator every study that came through had a sub-study, right? Yeah. Um, usually a genetic component. Um, so I think there's a lot of different factors. Um, there's a lot of other people involved now as well. That's right. right. The sub-studies, they, you don't see them anymore. Yeah. As much. And as you're much, saying yeah. it's because the pro- they decided, they, the industry decided that, I guess, collectively, let's just make the studies more complex and we can just sneak that in into the main protocol and not have to waste time and, and resources with a sub-study. Well, I know the sub-studies I worked on, they're all coming to market. Like I did when okay. I, cause I was a, when I was a CRC, I was doing it for diabetes. Okay. okay? That was my little area. Um, and we used to have all the sub-studies would be, have a genetic component because they wanted to research see, you know, how genetics affects your response to the drug. Well, now that technology is here, ah. right? Um, so we won't see those sub studies in that respect. We might see other sub studies. We might see, and I think it changes as the industry changes. I see. Right. I see. Um, but like I said, AI is huge right now. Yeah. And another thing that's important is this whole concept of health economics, which I don't think people discuss enough. Right. We used to um, see that too in the studies, like the economic impact. They had patients do their own surveys for. You know, how does this drug, especially long-term drug, uh, long-term studies, how does this drug impact your economical outcomes? Right. So this is something, um, again, you can have specialized medical writers in health economics. It was something, again, that I was kind of like thrown into, wow. but we're doing a lot of that in my company right now, um, because I think all of the regulatory bodies have recognized the importance of patients and caregivers, right? And that the cost of a disease is not, you know, just how much a drug costs, right? Mm. There's transportation to see your doctor, right? There's caregivers taking time off work to help you. There's all these different factors now. And I think sponsors have realized that these need to be included 
incorporated into the clinical studies, right? Um, because they are a huge fossil and, and the regulatory bodies are asking for these now as well. So patient reported outcomes, which are those questionnaires of quality of life and things like that, that adds complexity now to the protocols and the studies. I see. As a writer, do you write those too, the PROs or is that a, like somebody else comes up with those? A lot of them come from um, standardized resources, but you will have, you know, investigators that are bringing out their own. We do help with that as well, right? Um, you know, the great thing about me being a medical writer is that it's so flexible that you can choose what you want to be involved in, right? Yeah. Um, especially if you're a freelancer, um, you really get to choose, like, if you don't want to write these questionnaires, well, you just don't take on that work, right? If you do, yeah. then there's a lot of opportunity for you to do that. Wow. <laughs> this is incredible. The, I want to continue with the protocols becoming more complicated. I love how you just broke it down with the science technologies getting better. We can, we know enough about genomics now. We don't necessarily need more genetic sub studies, but maybe there's going to be something in the future, like microbiome. You know, I think we know very little about that. I personally know a few doctors in that space that are raving about this is the next genetic, this is microbiome. Uh, so maybe we'll see the, like those kind of sub-studies. But my, my biggest, like when I said I, I want to like strangle the people who wrote my protocol that I'm a coordinator on, it's not the endpoints, it's the inclusion-exclusion criteria. The, when I refer to them being more complex, that's what I'm referring to. But I see what you're saying also about the endpoints, but like these IE criteria, they just keep getting stricter. And I'm wondering, like, is that the sponsor trying to kind of cherry pick the candidates? So being devil's advocate here, right? <laughs> the medical writers usually get the brunt of everything Yeah, because people don't understand what we do. But everything that we put into a protocol has a reason, right? It's not just, you know, let's make them their life difficult and put, you know, these requirements in there. Yeah. Sometimes the regulatory bodies themselves require certain things that we have to have to put in a protocol, right? Um, and if we don't, you run the study for nothing because you can't submit it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of factors that go in to those inclusion exclusion criteria. And I can tell you they're one of, you know, they're not easy to write in the protocol. And there's usually a lot of back and forth. What I always tell my clients and I always suggest is that there should at least be one round of clinical review or some kind of operational review so that we do get the perspective of the clinic, right? So um, I've been involved where I actually, you know, I don't just sit back as this like mythical writer. Right. I actually have meetings with the clinics, right. When I'm working with them. Um, and I'll say, you know, as a, the perspective of a, you know, a coordinator, is this even feasible? Like, do you have this patient population that can meet these criteria? And very often they'll tell us, no, we don't. Yeah. Right. And we'll say, well, what do you have? Right. And we'll try and incorporate. So I think open communication is very, very important. And I like for me, of course, with my, you know, company, I always, always push for a clinic perspective. That's, that's really good. I mean, I wish we'd have more medical writers like that. What, what do you think you were mentioning the regulatory bodies, oftentimes requiring the, the IE criteria be a certain way over the years? What, like, what's the trend? Is it getting stricter? Or are the regulatory bodies getting a little more lenient as far as how that's uh, how that process goes? Um, Just your opinion. As always, there, I don't think it's as clear cut. Um, the great thing about what is happening in the world right now, right, um, is I think the pandemic has brought technology to the present that may have taken longer to come, right? Having said that, I think there is a lot of opportunity for the trailblazers out there because there's a lot of technology and things that have we haven't had before, right? And as the regulatory body sees these new technologies, you are developing like the policies with these studies as you are the first ones there. So you have a responsibility, I think, to have robust research and data, right? And to do it well. 
but you have an opportunity to give the feedback to the regulatory bodies as well, saying, you know what, this is feasible and this is not. And again, I think it comes back to open communication. We're not silos in clinical research, right? Like the CRCs are not separate from the medical writers. And I know a lot of people see it that way and it shouldn't be that way. Yeah, I see it that way. (laughs) I mean, I think it's impossible not to see it that way when you work in the industry, but I think where I agree with you, like where I, I'm starting to see more and more like overlap as far as career possibilities. I didn't even realize coordinator would be a great place to get your medical writing career going, but you're absolutely right. I'm so glad you came on to kind of let us know about that. You're going to inspire a bunch of people, (laughs) Christina, like for sure. No, I hope so. Um, you know, if you go on Indeed right now or any of these job sites, you can see the amount uh, of people looking for medical writers right now. Like wow. the industry has just boomed. And the issue they're having, like I'll have recruiters call me all the time. And I'm like, I'm okay right now. Like I got my business going. But the problem they're having is that there's no entry level positions and everybody wants to write with 10 years experience, right? Yeah. Well, it's saturated right now. We don't have enough writers, right? I see. And so who's doing all the... Who's doing all the work? Because I can tell you from like CRA and CRC level, there's also a shortage right now. And yes. But there's all these new studies. So what they're doing, they're just giving more work to the existing people. What is it like in medical writing? It's the same thing, right? <laughs> like I think burnout is prevalent across the industry as a whole right now, right? Um, the people that I've brought on on my company are fresh and I'm training them. Um, wow. Okay. One thing you'll know about me, I'm very big on social conscious and health literacy, right? And again, health literacy is a new term that people are not talking about yet, right? Um, but unless we bring on new people and train them, right, the industry is going to suffer from shortages. So for me, you know, on, on a, a more global scale, I want to do my part and I want to, you know, give my knowledge to those new people coming on, right, and train them. And yeah, I fully expect them one day to leave me. They're not with me for life, right? Um, But I think we do need that focus, you know, to give the younger people or the newer people, whether it's a career change or whatever, right? Give them an opportunity to show you what they really can do. How do you, I guess we'll end with this. And everybody, everybody needs to go connect with Christina right now. Um, LinkedIn profile is underneath. She's very responsive. She's got a great profile. As you can see, she's got a lot of knowledge she's willing to share. Let's end with what is your definition of healthcare literacy? Health literacy? Yeah, health literacy, um, it's, sorry. It's basically, um, it's very directed to what we call the average person, the general public, right? Um, so that when they go and see their doctor, they understand what is going on with their own health. Right. So it's allowing people to get giving people the knowledge so that they can be responsible for their health as well. Because let's face it, a lot of people go to the doctor now and the doctor's talking and they got no clue what's being said. Right. right. <laughs> but they have all these questions. They don't know how to communicate those questions. Um, and even if they did communicate to the doctor, they may not understand the, the response because not everybody has a background in science like we do. Right. Um, so it's about empowering people about health. Right. right. Um, and helping them understand. And I think that's what the pandemic has done sh- too. It has shown the gaps in society where we really, really need to focus on that health literacy. Yeah. And I think health literacy is something, it's a goal that can never truly be achieved because even people like us, well, I don't want to speak for you, but myself, like I've been in research for 20 years, you know, I'm not familiar with a lot of the therapeutic indications are areas like cardio. I'm not that good in nephrology, um, immunology. I'm not good in those. I'm good at like central nervous system, a little bit internal medicine, a little bit of oncology now, some derm, but like when I go see a doctor and think, thank God I haven't for like kidneys or something, but let's say renal, right? I don't know. My health literacy is not good either. I mean, I don't know it much. Maybe I have a framework for how like using the process from CNS and oncology, how, how I've learned, maybe I have a framework. So maybe I'm further ahead than a lot of people, but I wouldn't consider myself health literate in that field. So this never ends, right? 
No, just like everything, you're always learning. But think about it. When you go to a doctor, he gives you a new drug or something or a new treatment, right? Yeah. What do you get? Brochure or pamphlet. Right. It's a medical writer that wrote that, right? Yeah. That took that scientific information. And usually we try and hit a grade five to eight level when we're really translating to the patients, right? So that tells you on a whole, a population, if, if to communicate with the average person, you have to be at a five, grade five to eight level. Right. Right. Um, but it's a medical writer producing all of those documents, <laughs> right? Not a regulatory one, maybe, but there's specific ones that just deal with how do we translate the scientific material so that the patients can understand. And again, I think we're just really starting to recognize the value in that. And we do have, you know, a way to go. Um, but the more people that recognize that, the more people that want to learn about that and participate in that, right? Um, I think it's just going to lead to a better society as a whole. Yeah, no, this is, we got to keep doing more and more interviews. I know I said that was the last question. I have one more because as you were talking, I, this came up. So there's a push towards patient centricity and a lot of that bothers me. Not, not the ideal that's who can argue with that. It's like saying you love puppies who who's going to argue with that, but the way it's being implemented, like we're seeing stricter protocols, right? More IE criteria. That's to me, not patient centric. Uh, health literacy definitely is patient centric. So there's a push towards getting patients. And I guess, I guess they call them influencers or patient empowered patients, something like that. There's terms for these like very involved patients that represent larger communities to get involved with some aspects of medical writing, maybe protocol design. What, what is your experiences with this and thoughts on this? Is this too idealistic or is this something that is actually being implemented properly right now? So you are right. That is a major issue right now, right? Um, and I think the sponsors have great intentions, right? To bring in those patient perspectives. But what has happened in the industry is that remember clinical trials are being run under ideal conditions right? Mm -hmm. Everything that can be controlled for is controlled. But what happens now when it's approved and it's out in the world, those ideal conditions no longer apply. So what is happening is that they're finding that the data from those clinical studies are not reflecting real life, right? And that's another aspect where the health economic comes in and this concept of like real world data and real world evidence, right? Is yeah. how do we translate that, that information over? And it is an area right now, people are trying right? We're trying to work at, it, but it's, we're still looking for a solution, right? Of how to translate that. Um, because the patient perspective is so very, very important. So if any of, you know, your viewers, you know, of a way to do that, right? Um, there's lots of people out there that are looking for these answers. And I think as a global community, if we can come together, I think, you know, maybe we can come up with some solutions for that. Wow. Yeah. Gabriella, thank you so much for putting us in touch. This I know we were only scheduled for an hour, but we got to do more, Christina. <laughs> we'll do more. Casey, anything you want to add? I just want to let you know that that was very, very educational. It, it actually makes me want to do more research on medical writing. Um, I just never put the two and two together. It, it my mind is blown. This, this was Christina, awesome. Christina awesome. Casey tells every guest this. No, I'm just kidding. No, I do not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool, Casey. Yeah, I think so too. I was blown away by, because to me, it sounded like such a boring topic, but then the way you just broke it down, you made it very pragmatic. And I think there's some a lot of actionable things here too for people looking for careers in clinical research. So well, everybody- honestly, yeah, go ahead, Casey. Sorry, me as a clinical research coordinator for 10 years, I, I never put the two together. Um, like you said, the brochures that once it does hit the market, those are all written by you guys. And, and again, you being a clinical research coordinator and writing protocols with that mindset, you're going to have a dozen, more than a dozen a clinical research to look people looking for you i, oh, I guarantee yeah. it they're after gonna this podcast yeah they're, go they're gonna yes. be hitting you up like crazy on linkedin I i'm gonna go find you on linkedin <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna have sponsors hitting you up like hey come on christina let's talk but yeah i'll definitely hit you up too we gotta do more christina any last 
things you want to share or you want to leave like maybe a cliffhanger for part two, maybe a good topic, like just to leave people on, on, a, on the edge of their seats? Um, I don't know about a cliffhanger, but a word of <laughs> advice um, for anyone entering medical writing. And I tell this to all the students I train um, and everyone I come across, do not take things personally, right? You're never going to write a document the right way perfectly on draft one. And if it comes back with all these revisions, it's not personal. And I've seen people get really upset. I've seen people argue over where to put a comma, right? To the point that they don't want to talk to each other anymore, right? It's not personal. It's part of the review process and it's necessary. Um, so don't get upset about it, right? Um, and just kind of go with the flow. And I think that's what makes a really, really good writer is not taking it personal. Mm. Excellent. Christina, we're going to do part two. Let's give people a little bit of time to digest this, unpack. There's a lot here. Go connect with Christina right now. Thank you so much, Christina, for coming on. You made medical writing exciting for me. I never take notes, telling I took notes in this interview. <laughs> Um, so thank you so much. And thank you, Casey and Gabriella for setting this up. Guru Nation, thank you for watching, listening. Keep the questions coming and we'll catch you all later, guys. Bye-bye.